right, here we go. Well, why the heck am we doing this? So um, our EOC was built to destroy ham radio communications 20 years ago with the most amazing noise generators you could imagine. Uh, solid state backup, uninterrupted power supplies, generators, oh my gosh, computer systems, and all the computer storage for the whole county in that building. Horrendous noise on all of our antennas. So we had to solve that and they've decided to build a new place. So we are desperate not to let them repeat the issue because the new place does not have a set of woods behind it that we can go hide our antennas in. There's a park behind it and we will get into trouble if we do that. Let me see if any of these works. Yeah, this one works. Okay. Um, so this is the way that professionals talk about noise. And this comes from uh, the Radio Society of Great Britain and from the ITU, International Telecommunications Union. And they talk about noise. These are frequencies. This is the 3.5 megahertz band. This is the 30 meter band. This is the 20 meter band. Um, and they measure it in the E field, the actual electrical field in dB microvolts per meter. It's not just a voltage, it's a voltage over space. And it's the strength of the E vector of the electromagnetic wave, which as you remember, is a transverse wave that has magnetic and electrical potentials to it. So galactic noise from the universe and um, all of the lightning storms that happen all over the earth produce noise. And this is what like suburban noise looks like this, rural noise looks like this, and quiet rural supposedly looks like this. And that's what the ITU said. The Royal Society, Radio Society of Great Britain uh, did some measurements. Their measurements don't completely agree but it kind of falls in this range at their measuring sites. They spent years trying to measure the noise. So I can't present stuff to the builders of the new EOC in terms of S units. That's not gonna be a professional term. Um, and if I give them DBM off of a spectrum analyzer, it depends on what antenna was used. So I need to be able to use industry standard specifications of E-field of noise coming off of equipment. So I need a calibrated antenna. Oh, that's no problem. They sell them. Um, <clears throat> it's a three foot monopole with a high impedance input amplifier. And there's also a ground plane that goes with it. And if you'll just let me have the 3000, I can buy a used one so I can make my measurements. Uh, takers? I didn't think so. Yeah, you said it's a three foot. Is it three foot or is it 39? Inches? Oh, I'm sorry. It's one meter. One meter. Um, and these are pretty nice antennas designed to work up to at least 30 megahertz, if I remember right. And it's calibrated. So one of the things that always perplexed me was, so if you put your antenna up, how much voltage are you going to get off the terminals? And nobody ever told me the answer to that in, in engineering school, but it's in Wikipedia. <clears throat> so there's this number called antenna factor. And because it's a factor, you multiply it. And so you multiply it times the electric field strength, or if you're using dBs, you just add them. And it tells you the voltage that you're going to get on the terminals of your antenna, which is, I think, really cool. And obviously it depends on the antenna, right? So for this $3,000 job, it's been measured and they can tell you the calibration of the antenna factor for every frequency. <clears throat> okay, so the CISPR standards in Europe and the FCC part 15 standards in the United States all use a vertical monopole type antenna. In the FCC stuff, it's buried. I don't know how many different abstractions you have to go through to find where they really said to do it, but it's some NTSD standard eventually. 
but it's a vertical antenna. That doesn't do me much good because <clears throat> we don't use verticals. <clears throat> we need to reach Tallahassee, not California. If my goal was to reach California, well, a vertical would be great for DX and I can work Japan and Asia while I'm at it, but I need to get to Tallahassee. In order to get to Tallahassee, I got to do this maneuver. And in order to do that, I don't need low angle radiation from a vertical. I need high angle radiation from an invis antenna, which is a horizontal antenna that is at a modest height instead of a huge height. So um, we have done all of our measurements with horizontal antennas because it fits what we need, not what the standards are written for. So there's this Ohm's law problem. We get these measurements off the spectrum analyzer that are in dBm, decibels related to a milliwatt. And those are power. And we need to convert it to voltage. So then we can use the antenna factor to convert it back to E field in volts per meter. Oh my gosh, this takes some math. But it ends up that it's this equation. The dB microvolts per meter of your E field is equal to 107 dB plus whatever dBm your spectrum analyzer says, assuming it's calibrated, plus the antenna factor of your antenna, assuming that's calibrated. And I actually did derive this, but <clears throat> it's easier just to look it up because all the EMI guys and EMC guys, this is the equation will always show up on their website. And it involves the 50 ohms. I think that's what gives you the seven. And it involves dealing with voltages and microvolts and dBMs, which is millis. And we're talking about micros. And so there's some switcheroos with the decimal points. Well, I don't want to pay three grand. So how am I going to calibrate some antenna that I can easily carry around and use for all my measurements how am I going to, I got to become my own calibration standard. Well, <clears throat> it turns out if I had an antenna <clears throat> that I did know it's the antenna factor, I could use isotropic noise in the environment as my standard. And I could measure it with the known antenna and I could measure it with my proposed measurement antenna. And I could do a little math between the two. And theoretically, get a calibration for this antenna. So that is what I tried to do. So it turns out, and you can get this off Wikipedia, that if you've got a full-size dipole, the antenna factor is known. And you can actually calculate what voltage will be developed by what E field by an 80 meter dipole or a 40 meter dipole or a 20 meter dipole or any other antenna. And that antenna factor is equal to 9.72 divided by the wavelength times the gain. What gain do I use? Well, we're talking isotropic noise. Doesn't matter what the gain of your antenna is. Noise comes from all directions. So what you pick up from one side, you're not gonna pick up from another side. So in effect, the gain of an antenna is always one if you're talking about an isotropic source, which is noise. So I ran these numbers <clears throat> and on 80 meters, the antenna factor in linear terms is 0.113. And I think that means that your voltage will be one tenth of the E field. I'm not sure about that. Um, and if you convert it to logarithms, remember there's a 20 log because it's voltages, it's about negative 19 dB. dB dB whatevers. And on 40 meters, it's negative 13. And on 10, uh, 30 meters, it's negative, just about negative 10. So you can actually have a calibrated antenna that you can hang up in your backyard and you can actually know what its antenna factor is. Um, so that's pretty useful. Okay, I already ran through that horrible equation once before, so I'll skip going through it again. But this time I gave you the reference I pulled it off of H systems, useful formulas for RF related conversions, but it, it's everywhere. It's always the same because it just comes from Ohm's law and 50 ohms. 
Uh, again, noise is noise, so it doesn't matter whether I measure it with a big antenna or a small antenna, we're in the same E field close because unfortunately I didn't do my experiment perfectly, but it was good enough for the start. So here's what I did. Um, I had my antenna out in the backyard and I knew its antenna factor. I, I made the simplifying assumption that even though it's a hundred foot non-resonant antenna, it's close to a full size antenna for several different frequencies. That's not exactly true, but for a first cut uh, effort, it was good enough for me. I made sure it was tuned on each band when I made the measurements by setting the SWR individually for each band to make sure it was tuned right with an antenna tuner. So I got all that right. <clears throat> and then this has a 10 foot RG8X cable and that is part of the loss system because this is certainly not matched. It is not tuned. And so that introduces loss, but that gets built into the antenna factor for each band, and so it just, it's inside the fudge factor. Goes into a 50 ohm spectrum analyzer, a siglet in my case, but I can only get 10 feet away from the spectrum analyzer because that's all the length of this cable. And if I add more length to it, I'll change the measurement because the loss will get worse. So the mistake I made in retrospect, my antenna was outside and I shoved this thing eight feet out onto the, top of my porch on the on the uh, shingles out the second floor window and I think my measurement's pretty good for 80 meters but other work that I've done since then suggests to me that my measurement for 40 meters and 30 meters are a little off so I'm going to have to go redo those measurements by going into the backyard and, and holding this thing up near my other antenna and I may cut an 80 meter and a 40 meter and a 20 meter antenna and literally hold them all at about the same place and redo these measurements. Because I've, I've concluded there, it's not perfectly accurate. But here's what I got for my first cut at this was, I think that number's correct. I think that number's off a bit and that number's off even more. But typically a short antenna does this kind of a number where you have to have more of a correction for the lower frequency and the antenna becomes better and better as you get to a, a shorter wavelength because it is short and so it works better at shorter wavelengths, higher frequencies. So this is the calibration that I came up with. <clears throat> oh, I already told you this. So I think my uh, 40 meter, 30 meter efforts are not quite as reliable as I would like. Okay, so we're moving the EOC. And I want to have proof when these jokers put in stuff that makes my life miserable. So I needed a baseline of what was the noise before you guys brought in all your equipment and installed all this fancy. So we needed to make this. And I went out there to try to um, make this measurement of what the baseline noise was at my EOC. And anybody can do this. This is not hard. If you duplicate this antenna, which is real simple, it's one foot of shield this way and one foot of center conductor that way, and then 10 feet, RG8X, connect to your spectrum analyzer, done. $3,000, did I have any takers? Um, so uh, I, did, I did one just for fun, but I don't think they have anything to do with it. I, I don't think they have anything to do with it. So the first time we did this, I set up out here on the front lawn, there's a power line there, and that had me really nervous. And the second time, you'll see we had to redo the measurements because we made a boo-boo. Second time, we have our card table here, and we're out in the back of the new EOC, and there's our antenna and spectrum analyzer, and a very uh, patient friend helping me make these measurements. Uh, here was the first boo-boo we made. <clears throat> So uh, my spectrum analyzer is a nice $1,400 siglent, but it does not have a 12 volt power input. I wished it did. It only has 110 volts AC. So I have to have 110 to run the thing. And so stupid me, I have this special inverter system with ferrites everywhere that we use during field day to run our computers to be legal when we tell them we're running off solar panels. I actually run the computers off the solar panels also. So I have to run the chargers for the computers. 
but we had this noise. This is like zero to 30, and this is FM. These are FM transmitters in my home city, and I don't know what that is. I, I, that's something, but these are FM. They're all at FM frequencies. And we thought this was real. We thought, okay, that's the bass fun noise. Um, but when I went back home and looked at data that I had done years earlier, I discovered that at my house, and I can't read that. Let me see where that is. That is up to 80, negative 85 at the peak, but it should have been at negative 110 because that's where my house is. My, the noise in my house on this antenna is negative 110 dB. So I said, uh-oh, I think my power supply isn't as quiet as I thought. And I went outside and cranked up the diesel generator, which has no voltage regulator other than a mechanical governor. And it makes almost no noise. And sure enough, it was much quieter. And when I powered the same system with this antenna and my little inverter, it looked just like that. So I made my own noise. So we had to go back and make the measurements over again. Um, the other thing that I've discovered is that utility power is almost always very quiet. And if you're worried about it, you can put a filter on the AC line that you're using for utility power. A ferrite with 11 turns through it is a pretty good shot. Or you can buy, the filters are like $11 each on Amazon. You can buy filters that have pretty good rejection. So we went back and did the whole thing over. We did it a couple of different ways. I, I took the whole diesel generator, it's on a trailer, and I took it with me, and we set it on the other side of the parking lot. We ran 150 feet of, of uh, extension cord to get it as far away as we could, and I used a $123 MIF-23 filter on top of the diesel generator, which has like 50 to 100 dB of isolation. So I did everything I could to get the cleanest power I could possibly get, and I redid all the measurements, and sure enough, it was quiet as all get out. And on the other side of the building, the building was vacant when we did this, uh, we discovered that there was a power outlet on the outside that worked. So we, we made measurements with it as well, and the, they were the same. With, with the diesel generator, with the outside power, it was all the same. This is an example of what the MIF filter does. Um, for a differential mode, it's up to negative 80 dB. For a common mode, it's almost 100 dB. This is one megahertz, this is 10 megahertz. You see a little bit of decline there down to about 80 dB. This is one megahertz, this is 10 megahertz. So it's in the 70 dB class. It's a very nice filter. It's intended for industrial applications to quiet down pulse code modulated machines that do all kinds of machinery kind of stuff. Okay, so we did two different locations. This is a satellite view of where our new EOC is gonna be. This is a high voltage power line. This is supposed to say tree, 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 but it doesn't. It says tray, tray, tray. Um, here's the ancient building. This building was used to monitor Soviet to Cuba tra radio transmissions in the 1950s, I believe, in Gainesville, Florida. They must have antennas. I don't know what they did, but they tore all that stuff out. So, but it was a, apparently a very fancy building back then. We did one measurement behind the building because we want to put antennas here and here. And we did one measurement here because we want to put a uh, tilt up telescoping tower with a beam on top and antennas on top too, um, verticals at that location. So we did both of these locations. <clears throat> and um, here was what we got. So uh, the DBM measurement comes from the um, spectrum analyzer. Um, and all of these were just slightly higher than the baseline noise of the spectrum analyzer. You always have to set the spectrum analyzer and measure what your noise floor is on the analyzer itself. And thankfully, I could get down there. You generally want to make these measurements at a 9 kilohertz bandwidth. Because remember, noise is white. It's it, The more bandwidth you use, the more power you'll pick up, right? 
So there's an agreed upon nine killers. The only problem is my cheap spectrum analyzer can't do nine. The closest it can do is 10. So there's a conversion you can use to fix that, but it's it's like a very small amount of fraction of the dB. It's not worth worrying about. Um, if you believe my antenna factors, which I think a couple of them are off, then you can calculate the dB microvolts per meter. And at 3.5, which is the one that I believe, at location one, I was 0.1 dB microvolts per meter. Compare this to an EMP, which is 25 kilovolts per meter. And this is microvolts per meter. Now you see why an EMP is a problem. At location two, we were slightly more noisy, 2.1 dB microvolts per meter. These numbers, I'm not, for 40 and 80, I, I don't think are, excuse me, for uh, 40 and 30, I'm not convinced are accurate. Um, I wanna show you what how this compares to what we did at the old facility. <clears throat> Now, I didn't have antenna factor back when I did that. What I had was just DBM, but it was this antenna, the same exact antenna. And this is stuffing that antenna through the trap door onto the roof of our EOC, where our big fancy antenna was hung above the roof. I remember I showed you the measurements before, which was like negative 122 DBM. Well, this was negative 60 dBm. That is 60 more dB of noise where our antenna was on top of the roof. 60 dB is 1 million times more noise, which means if you could receive a one watt signal at our quiet location, you would need a 1 million watt signal to hear it at this location. So the, it, no wonder we were deaf. Now, this was data that we did. Um, this is the noise floor back when I made that measurement. I didn't have it set up quite as well as I did this time. Um, and these were measurements that were done in the parking lot and on the back corner of the building. And what we discovered was the noise that our building generated was near field noise. Normally far field noise goes down by the square of the distance and that's not too fast, but near field noise goes down by the cube or the fourth power of the distance. So near field noise from a radiator is much easier to get away from. And what we found was if we went into the adjoining lot, which the county then bought and put our antennas up in the trees about 75 yards away from the building, we got down to acceptable numbers. And so that's what we had to do. And the, this, this chart was the proof that our noise was a near field phenomenon that we could actually escape. But these, these noises, this is negative 80 dB, whereas the new EOC is like negative 120, it's 40 dB quieter. That's, that's a phenomenal difference. That's 10,000 times quieter. So the reason we did all this, now here, here's what shows why I think those other two numbers are not good. Um, I, took, I took those numbers and I plotted them on the same chart that you get from the Radio Society Great Britain. That's our 3.5 megahertz quiet number at the new facility. That's our seven megahertz quiet number. It's not too far off from a measurement that the RSGB made. There's our 30 meter number. Oh, nobody was that quiet. So I suspect my measurement is not correct there. Whereas I suspect my other measurement is correct because uh, even pushed out onto the parapet over my back porch, it's not too far away from the antenna and 80 meter energy is probably still about the same there. Okay, so I know this is, uh, noise is something that hams deal with a lot, but. Um, in an engineering perspective, it's not something that we deal with a lot. And the concepts of white noise, the concepts of dB microvolts, dB microvolts per meter, all these fancy ways of measuring stuff is a little bit foreign to ham radio operators who are used to thinking in terms of S meters, which are unreliable. I made measurements on my S meter and it was three dB per S unit, not six, like it's supposed to be. And I just proved, I published that in one of our papers. 
Making accurate noise measurements is very tricky. It requires attention to inadvertent corruption due to power supply noise. And that's what happened to me the first time I tried it. I think our antenna factor calibration for seven and 10 is suspect. The new EOC site, it doesn't have anything there yet, is very quiet. Well, that's what you'd expect, but we proved it. It's not, there's not noise coming from the neighborhood. That power line out front apparently is quiet. Um, so we're in good shape until they start adding all their equipment. Now, we have, we have written papers, white papers, telling them how we think they can equip their building and avoid causing problems. And I've got a paper I'm going to try to submit to QEX on some of that uh, data that we've written. But we did this so we would have the goods on them if they cause us a problem. And we say, look, you know, this was a very quiet place until you added that air conditioner. So would you be willing to now retrofit it because it does not have the, the specifications that we suggested to you were necessary in real life and maybe they will listen to us. Then we, uh, because I already have the DBM measurements, when I get the correct antenna factor, I can just go back and change the multiplier and redo that data without having to go remeasure anything. Um, and I can take the data from our measurements that were done years ago at our EOC, and I can convert those all properly to dB microvolts per meter. I just need to redo. My first set of efforts was not quite 100%. So if you need to make a measurement, either at your house or at a professional facility like at EOC, if you've got a full-size antenna, it's real easy to do. You can calculate the antenna factor yourself, don't need to do anything. If you want to be able to carry it around, then you wanna build something like this and you wanna get me to finish the calibration of it so you don't have to pay the three grand to buy their thing. And if I can get this published in QEX, then we'll actually have a paper you can refer to. And then we can all measure noises. I, I'm aware of some EOCs where frankly, they just can't do HF because of too much noise from uh, HVAC systems with switcher motors and things like that. And we would like to avoid that because HF is the backup system that uh, may be all we've got if somebody destroys all of our satellites. Okay, so any questions, comments? Yes. So how do you write this into the specification for the suppliers? Great question. He's asking, how do we actually write specs? So um, I, I gave this talk about an hour or two ago <clears throat> in the other room. We did measurements and an anecdotal setup, my house, only one I had. And we actually measured what was the noise signature of one particular device. And then we measured what was the radiated noise that it that my antennas picked up. The noise signature of the device was conducted noise, which is how the FCC measures that kind of thing. And since this is all a linear system, there's no amplification of the noise once it comes out of the device. It's just radiated and picked up by my antenna. It's a linear system. If you cut the noise generation by 10 dB, the pickup will also cut by 10 dB. So we were able to make we were able to measure the baseline noise at my house. And with this amount of noise added by this device under test, which was a generator, an inverter generator, we were able to show how much noise my noise floor went up. And so then we could say, well, if you had met class B standards, home standards, it would have been okay. If you had exceeded class B standards at this frequency by five dB or whatever, it would have been okay. So we are able to take those measurements and tell the manufacturer, you not only have to say that you meet class B standards, when we install it, it needs to meet class B or exceed class B by this amount. And if it does that, we should be okay. Class A, you're gonna to have to exceed by a good bit because class A is industrial standards and they're a lot looser. But we did that measurement, we've got that data. That's part of what I'm gonna to try to publish and um, it's just one instance at my house, but it gives you a baseline for saying, you not only have to say you meet class B, you have to actually meet class B. 
the way that class B is measured is a screwy way. They put things on a table 80 centimeters above the ground and they connect it by the power cord. And that's not how you use generators. You put generators on the ground, they're heavy, and you ground them if you're smart. And that makes them a much better transmitter than if you had put them on a table. So when we did the normal things with a generator, it's a darn good transmitter, way worse than class B spec. And it shows, and we pick up lots of noise. So we now have the transfer function mapped out from one class B device, but it's enough to give us information for all of them. Good question. Did that answer it for you? I, I think so. So, I mean, you get, you know, I suspect pushback from suppliers. Yeah, um, <clears throat> because they're not, they're probably going to have great trouble meeting this. First of all, they're going to measure it according to FCC standards, which is not good enough. And we want it measured in situ at our facility. Do you still meet class B standards the way we're going to install it? And if you don't, we're going to have problems. Now, how do we get around that? How do we mitigate it? So it turns out that there are ways to do that. So if it's an industrial device, there are industrial filters. They're all over the marketplace is littered with them because everybody has the same problem. And you can easily buy a big filter in a big box that you screw to the wall and you connect up, get an electrician to connect it up. And it filters the power going into this big honking thing that you bought. And it will make the power wiring a lot quieter. And it's power wiring in your building that is the antenna. That's what kills you. You got a, in, you're covered with an, it's like a fair occasion reverse. You're living inside the antenna. The second thing is you can filter on the output and there are consumer devices that can be put on either the input or the output. I found them. They're like a hundred bucks each and there's not a lot of them, but I found them. And so I documented by this device from Triplight, by this device from whoever the other UPS manual, they make some filters. <clears throat> They're not great, but they do work. The industrial filter that we use is the MIF 23. We found it on eBay for as little as 70 bucks. You buy it new, they're more like 130, 140 bucks. They're a great filter. And you put that on the input of a UPS and it's quiet. You may also have to put it on the output. The output usually is not where the problem is, it's the input. It's those diodes and the switching that go on and off and on and off, sucking power real fast to charge up that capacitor. That's where the RF gets generated. And then your whole house wiring is the antenna. Same problem if you've got solar panel system, your charge controller is making huge amounts of noise and it's the same solutions for your charge controller to solve this problem. Any other questions? Yes. So basically, if you were to have going looking into putting a uh, solar generation system on your house, you would measure the your your noise level there. And then tell the, whoever it was that you know you need to meet, you know make it so that you're not any more than that class B standard. Uh, yeah, I would tell them you can increase my noise by two dB, and here's the baseline. Good luck. You know they may refuse to put in the system because they realize, hey, wait a minute, this guy can measure what we've done, and we know our stuff is dirty. But if you offer, hey, you know, I recommend you consider these filters. Some of these manufacturers would be willing to try to filter it. There are some manufacturers that, that sell solar panel gear that they say is really quiet. And um, you might consider trying those guys. But if you're smart, you make one of these measurements before you have the system installed. And then you do it again and see what happened. And you say, well, hey, you didn't do it. So I want you to add more filters until you get this thing quiet because I want my radios to work. So I've got a solar panel system that I had installed in my uh, vacation home up in North Carolina. It's a family home. It's been in the generations. Um, <clears throat> and it's noisy as all get out. So I'm, I just have to go shut it off. But um, I'm not there very much. Eventually, I will add filters to it and I'll quiet the thing down. But it's, it's a disaster. And I knew it was going to be a disaster. <laughs> but I needed the solar panel system. Why is that how it's like because I, did, I didn't have a chance to put any filters on it. And it's, a, it's on a small lot. And my antenna is right beside the panels. And the panels are where all the wiring is that the charge controller is 
sucking power in and out of. So it's not a straightforward feed from the power company. You got some sort of a device on it. I got solar panels. And they go into a charge controller. And the charge controller is a switcher. I mean, all charge controllers are switching power supplies. So they're just RF generators. And their antenna is the wiring to the panels. So that's the first noise generator. And the second noise generator is the inverter. And its noise is on the output side. And it goes to your house and uses your house wiring as the antenna. So I'm caught between two antennas. My solar panels are the first antenna. And my house wiring is the second antenna. And they're both trying to destroy my 20 meter DX. So I just got to turn the thing off. <laughs> but eventually, I will put in some of these fancy filters, maybe after the warranty runs out. Um, and uh, it'll probably quiet down dramatically after I do that. Because we, we were able to quiet that generator. We quieted once. Uh, it took us a MIF plus two or three toroids, 100 feet of extension cord, and it disappeared. You couldn't find it anymore. It was gone. We had the antenna set up in my uh, garage. We were using some um, ham sticks as the antennas. And, and after we were done, it was there. The S meter was not moving. We could turn the generator on, nothing. But it takes an enormous amount of filtering to do that because the generator is an in-fed transmitter operating with the extension cord as its antenna. And you got to filter, 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 filter. It's got a ground connection for the other half of its antenna system, and it uses the extension cord as a 100-foot-long, wonderful multiband in-fed antenna, common mode. So the noise engineering is, is quite a lot of work to try to solve your HF problems. I, I think there's one EOC that couldn't even operate on two meters. And, and we had, am I out of time? I don't want to run over. Um, <clears throat> this is a funny story. We had a guy in our group. He's now moved to Texas. He's a really great guy. He taught me a lot of stuff. He was an air conditioning installer, teacher, repairman, you name it. He could do anything with HVAC. He was a very down-to-earth guy. <laughs> um, and he became a ham. And we got him through his general class. His wife got through the extra, if I remember. Um, <clears throat> and he put in a two-meter antenna on a two-meter radio. And he was really active in our group. And then uh, one month he said, guys, some, something's wrong. There's new noise. I, we got this noise. We can't hear anything. In our two-meter radio, we just can't hear anything. Our group worked for two months trying to fix his problem. We drove and drove and drove around the neighborhood with an antenna. With an antenna. We listened to power lines and we looked in, in the neighbors who put up something, you know, and we found this pump that the county had, and we thought, what's the pump? And we got the county to switch the pump off. Didn't change anything. And we worked at this, and we drove, and we looked, and we spied, and we did all this stuff. And always it was really strong when we got near to his house. He had put in LED lights in his garage. And the lights were what were making the noise. And once he unplugged the new LED lights in his garage, because he had to make some extra income. So he started up this small business in his garage. That was where all the noise came from. Two meter noise from LED lights. Would never have expected that. But now we all know none of us are putting in LED lights, not those long ones, you know, <coughs> because I, I don't know if there are any that are safe. If you find some that are safe, you let me know. They're, they're getting better. The uh, first LED light I bought every time I flipped on that light, the FM radio, FM stereo radio was great working because it was that powerful. And nowadays you buy one. Uh, I find the Walmart brand is actually really low. Noise. Oh, good. Okay. I, I use Spectrum Analyzer and I read them. And uh, they're, they're, yeah, the latest ones are, are pretty much better. Very good. Okay, well, that's great information for us. Can you want to write an article on that for the North Florida section newsletter? I understand your section doesn't have one. And it only involves it. Uh, it took me a little while to figure it out, but you know they do generate a little bit of heat, and it wouldn't. You know, usually you just go around and shut off switches to see if it's that fault. So, um, but after a while, I kept getting this noise. Well, the bulb would warm up to a certain point, 
And then if I shut the switch off, went away. So, and it was an LED bulb. Uh, it surprised the heck out of me. Um, it, even, it, it even was affected by, it was another room, which sometimes was kind of cool. So if it was hot out, it would do it quicker. If it was cool out, it might not do it at all. <sighs> but that one bulb, and I didn't check to see the brand or anything, but you know, it was just a pure typical LED bulb. When it got hot, it would, it would buzz like crazy on, the, at, mm. and on two meters. We've never had a problem with compact fluorescent light bulbs. It's been these long tubular ones that have caused us the troubles. Was yours a long tubular one or was it a compact fluorescent? It's just a, a, an LED regular light bulb. Oh, a screw in. A screw in, yeah. Yeah, okay. I haven't had that problem yet, but we could. Yeah, uh, one of my students had a uh, uh, light bulb burn out on his truck. So instead of buying an incandescent, he says, Hey, you know what? I'll buy these long life LEDs. And he said he told me that whenever he stepped on his brakes, his FM stereo radio put working. So it was a DC full bulb. Yeah, but they have a switching supply built so into them. Got a switching supply inside, inside the bulb the to run the LEDs. As small as it was, they they did that. Now yeah. the switching system is going to be the death of us. You, you got to understand filters and you got to have some way to measure it. So you can buy uh, the tiny SA. The tiny SA is a cheap spectrum analyzer. And I don't have one, but um, that would be a wonderful addition. You could kind of calibrate it against somebody else if you can't and find any other way to calibrate it. And um, that would at least get you in the ballpark. It's not going to have the dynamic range that a normal spectrum analyzer has. So you may have a few problems with that, but... Um, it beats nothing and it'll catch loud noise sources. Okay, any other questions? All right, we're gonna roll up shop on this one.